In tonight's Health Watch, could your smartphone be causing you or your children to grow horns? Sounds absurd, but it's a serious question being posed. It's really scary. It's a, it's a big find. It's a big sign. It tells us that we're changing. I mean, we're changing the physical aspects of human beings. It only takes a few minutes of taping on the street to see dozens of people in that familiar 21st century position, head forward, craning to see what's on their phones. When you realize that the human head weighs about 10 pounds and for every inch it tilts forward, you double the pressure on your spine, pretty soon your neck is straining against a 20 or 30 pound weight. Well, it's kind of surprising that our bodies are being impacted by today's technology. You've heard of other ailments like text neck and texting thumb. Now we can add these horn-like structures to the list. Now, the researchers who discovered these growths are referring to them as prominent exostosis emanating from the external occipital protuberances. Those are just fancy scientific words, meaning that there's a bone spur found at the base of the skull. It does look sort of like a horn, but actually this is a bone spur near the base of the skull. A new study by Australian researchers say they found bone spurs. Researchers in Australia examined hundreds of x-rays and found that roughly 40% of people 18 to 30 years old who use their phones more than four and a half hours a day develop the growth. The likely cause? All that hunching over, sending texts and checking social media. Do you find yourself on your phone a lot? Yeah, I'm addicted because it's obsessive and you like that and your body's all like screwed up. They say smartphones and other handheld devices are contorting the human form. Physiatrist Dr. Lauren Fishman says bone spurs from neck pain are not all that surprising. Any overuse of a tendon inclines one to a calcification. The overuse and the consequent inflammation just seems to bring about calcification some of the time. In looking for the future of man and machine becoming one in what some futurists refer to as a singularity, scientists may have overlooked another one. Another way that technology is changing our actual bodies, think about this, technology may also be affecting more than just our bone structure, could be altering our nerves in our brain. Experts now believe that texting and uh, voice to text specifically could be limiting young adults' ability to read and write. Until the age of about 24, 25, our brains neurologically are not fully formed. And so the ages in question, let's say between 9 and, and, and 17, these folks, these kids are not actually getting enough practice to utilize the neurotransmitters in their brain, the wiring that's not being utilized so that they can get used to the proper way of speaking. According to Professor Jane Milanby of Oxford University, the ability to understand and use complex language was essential for academic attainment, leaving youngsters without these skills at a serious disadvantage. Her research cited examples of text speak, including a 13-year-old's phone message that read, OMG, IKR, meaning, oh my god, I know, right? And a 21-year-old's message to a friend. Yo, dude, are you still coming to party Friday? I worry about that because I think that when our verbiage becomes more colloquial and filled with signs and images, we forget the proper way of speaking and we forget that communication is not just through slang, but also, th also through important eye contact and picking up the energy between two people. Tonight, lawmakers are adding to antitrust troubles for the likes of Facebook, Google, and Apple. YouTube has again shuffled about its hate speech and discrimination policy. This follows a sidestep, a moonwalk, two somersaults, and a backflip. Today, we're taking another step in our hate speech policy by specifically prohibiting videos, alleging that a group is superior in order to justify discrimination segregation or exclusion based on qualities like age, gender, race, caste, religion, sexual orientation or veteran status. If that was any more vague, it might as well have been fog, mist or a cloud perhaps. It's really that vague. Videos alleging a group is superior. Gosh, according to that statement, the hammer of politically correct judgment is about a fallen pater. The news of an antitrust investigation loomed over this year's Apple Worldwide Developers Conference. Federal antitrust regulators, according to CBS News, are pursuing investigations into Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon. I'm kind of 
concern like everybody are people becoming monopolistic and reducing competition. David Neal works in the tech industry and is attending this year's WWDC. He believes the government should keep a watchful eye for bad practices, but not necessarily break up big tech. We should look at times where maybe they're stifling the market and killing competition. On the other hand, if if companies are innovating and doing new things, we have to be very careful not to stifle that. The United Nations Secretary General has formally launched a strategy and plan of action on hate speech. The launch comes after a disturbing groundswell of intolerance, racism and xenophobia and hate-based violence targeting worshippers of many faiths. The UN strategy and plan of action is billed as an ambitious program to coordinate efforts across the UN system to identify, prevent and confront hate speech. The United Nations says hate speech has gained a foothold and is spreading like wildfire. But the UN boss believes it's on notice, putting in place a strategy he hopes will get buy-in from all member states. In both liberal democracies and authoritarian regimes, some political leaders are bringing the eight fooled ideas and language of these groups into the mainstream, normalizing them coarsening the public discourse and weakening the social fabric. Hate speech is in itself an attack on tolerance, inclusion, diversity, and the very essence of our human rights norms and principles. More broadly, it undermines social cohesion, erodes shared values, and can lay the foundation for violence, setting back the cause of peace, stability, sustainable development, and the fulfillment of human rights for all. Guterres laid out two overriding objectives for the plan. First, to enhance efforts to address the root causes of hate speech that include violence, marginalization, discrimination, poverty, and a lack of education, among others. Aspects that the current 2030 development agenda seek to address. But it does raise an interesting point. Who the hell are YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter? Are they platforms for people to chat on, express themselves? Or they censors, moral police responsible for how and what you say. Neither, apparently. If they start enforcing their own policies, no matter how vaguely, we'll stop hearing about the best country in the world, the freest country in the world, the greatest country in the world. He says, Daily Wire fellas, I'm proud of my Mexican ancestry, but mm -hmm. also am proud of my American nationality. How do I balance mm. these two things? Super simple. Celebrate Cinco de Mayo because you uh, are proud of your Mexican heritage. Believe that it is Mexico's Independence Day because you have American nationality. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's be honest. Our YouTube overlords didn't update their rules to take down America is great videos. But given that the rules are now so ambiguous they can be used to take down anything, what chance do even remotely political or controversial videos stand? Or, dare I say it, anything anti-establishment? Today we learned that Twitter and Facebook are ramping up efforts to clamp down on what they say is offensive or hateful content. But who gets to decide what's hateful or offensive? That in a corporate state, such as the one in which we live here, um, where corporations and the government you know, regularly concentrate to uh, you know, collect their power, censorship by corporations isn't so different than censorship by the government, is it? Because in the, case of in the case of Facebook, let's just talk about that for a second. They're in an outright partnership with the Atlantic Council, which is funded by NATO. It's a DC think tank. Some of the most prominent think tanks in the world are partnering with these so-called private companies. So are we that, even talking right. about the First Amendment? I feel like we might be. Well, well but, but let, let's go back. The antecedent aspect about this, you know, if you look back at how DARPA and NQTEL and other particular right. forces, platforms, were responsible for this. But let me look, let, let me give you a new idea. Let's look at this almost like a utility. By virtue of the fact, Michelle, that let's say 80%, 90% of the people on the planet use these platforms, mm. I don't think this is some mom and pop organization. What if you were on your phone, whatever your carrier, and you said something, and all of a sudden your phone dropped? and you call back again, and you repeated it at a phone call, and you found out that Sprint or Verizon, whoever it was, found that your statement 
was hateful or violated its terms. You would say, wait a minute, you're a phone carrier. You're not, you're not endorsing what I'm saying. This is what we have to treat these almost as though they're a utility. Hmm. Businesses, well, this show, everybody, are they're using these platforms. You've got to get rid of this ridiculous model that, there are, that Mark Zuckerberg is just some guy who owns this little diner. In, uh, in Collinsville, Illinois, and he's just a businessman. And if you don't like Facebook, go someplace else. Where? If you don't right. like Google, go someplace where. Th- 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 this model has to change immediately. Right. I mean, this is the situation with monopoly capitalism. Now, if I'm a government and I want to stop something from getting out, if I want to stop people from learning, you know, a piece of news, a, a monopoly like Facebook is a huge gift to me. All I have to do is keep control of one company. So it totally makes sense. Have you ever thought of how often you Google things? This noun that suddenly turned into a verb is as much a part of our lives as just about anything we use or ever come in contact today. And it's good, right? Hey, uh, think about it. It's useful, saves us a ton of time, and because we learn from it, stuff we never knew. Boom, Google, there it is. Now I know. Here's the problem. I don't know if you guys have thought about this. It also shapes and creates our reality, our truth. In other words, how do we know that what we get from Google is really the best description, the reality about this particular topic that we may have just, well, Googled? (laughs) 